Okay, welcome back. Let's do this. So, Moda 12, pretty cool, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of good changes in there. I really can't suggest enough going on to the Foundry's uh, Moda page and looking at all the updates and new things that they've added into the 12 series. There's honestly a lot of really good stuff there. Um, I think the hatchet collection of scripts and extensions are pretty neat. So, there's a lot of them. You'll find when you start exploring the hatchet collection that actually this used to be a kit that one of our developers in the Moto community sold, um, you know, privately. And it's a good collection of tools, so I can't recommend exploring it enough. There are a lot of scripts in there, a lot of scripts that, uh, that's going to make Moto behave differently. So start checking it out. It's pretty neat stuff. All right. Uh, so today, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to begin our exploration of the character rigging process by really kind of starting off looking at the animation system inside of Moto. Because remember, as character riggers, we're trying to make things move. Okay? In every sense, as character artists or character riggers, we're starting with a character at its T-pose that's hollow. There's nothing on the inside of our characters that tell the animation system how to make a bend, how to deform it, how to fundamentally make it move. And that's our responsibility as a character rigger. Okay? In every sense, the goal here is a system that's not too different from that of a traditional stop motion animation production pipeline. Specifically, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm just going to bring it up in the web here. And, uh, oops, misspelled that. Okay, so this, I always love looking at this. This is kind of cool. This is the King Kong armature. Okay, there's only a couple of these. Oops. There it is. Okay, this is the armature that they used for the King Kong puppet way back in the, in the turn of the century. King Kong is kind of a, a central kind of culture point for us in the animation industry as it, at the, it, as it was at the time and is still today just probably a really great example of how good stop motion animation can be. It's a good film. The original King Kong, not the Peter Jackson remake, which is also pretty good. It's kind of long, but pretty good. Okay. Uh, this is what was inside the puppet. Okay. Because if you think about it, there's a foam latex puppet that had some fur on it that represented King Kong. But in order to make that puppet move, they needed to have, they needed to create some sort of mechanical metal skeleton that allowed them to pose and have that pose, you know, kind of stick and stay stationary while they took a picture. Okay. I think there's only two of them, if I remember correctly from the history uh, of, of, of this. There was two King Kong puppets made. Um, one was a prototype th that they used to kind of sell the studio on the idea that this could work, right? Uh, and then they made a second one, which is fancier from what I understand, that they used to actually film the, you know, th the entire animation of King Kong. And uh, Peter Jackson, being a massive film nerd, has the original King Kong armature. And I remember seeing an interview with him, and the, uh, the person that was interviewing him Ass is like if your if your house is burning down, what's the one movie prop that you're gonna come in and get? And his house is just it's a museum of cinema history. And he says the thing I'm coming and getting, I'm gonna go get my King Kong armature because that thing is priceless in his mind. Um, so this is in essence kind of the system that we're replicating. We're not gonna be like you know milling pieces of aluminum and bolting together armatures, but we are gonna be creating a digital version of this. We're creating a marionette, kind of like a stop motion animation marionette. How we get there and how we bend our computer tools to give us this result, it's going to be a long journey and that really starts with a deconstruction and a good solid understanding of how the animation system works. Okay, Because there is a whole set of machinery behind the veil of the, uh, of the animation tab that we need to be aware of so that we can make it work for our characters. Okay. So that's where I want to start today, just looking at how some of the animation system over Moto fundamentally works. So as with all good demonstrations, we're going to start with a teapot. So I'm going to add unit primitives, and I'll just put it in, um, I'll just put it in a new mesh. There it is, teapot. Excuse me for a second while I change a couple things. I'm going to turn off, yeah, 
I'm going to turn off some turn off some things. Okay, so there we go. Here's our little teapot. Okay, so as you guys were exploring just a second ago in the 12 series, they've kind of fundamentally changed how we're going to be working with all of our objects. Okay, now right now, what what selection state am I currently in? What selection state am I currently in? This is a big time difference. Items, okay? In the 11 series of Moto, we had an item selection state button and it appeared, you know, to the right of that polygons button. And you just like, I'm in item mode by clicking on the buttons. Well, now that, that button has been removed and the whole idea behind it is that you are either in a component level selection state or you're not in a component level selection state. Since none of these buttons are depressed, the assumption is that, I'm, it, well, not the assumption, I am in fact working at item level. So if I wanted to work in polygons, boop, hit my polygons tab, and now all my wireframes appear and I'm ready to rock and roll. To go back into item mode, hit the button again, and now we're in item mode, okay? So that, that's a big time difference for us. I believe the number, the number keys still work. So hitting the five key, let's see, polygons, yeah, hitting the five key will still kind of transfer you back into item mode if you're using the keyboard shortcuts. All right, pop quiz. In the animation system inside of Moto, at what level inside of our hierarchy are we animating in? Because remember, we're working with inside of a hierarchy of different elements. What's the topmost element inside that hierarchy? World? Not world. Mesh. Mesh. You're very, very close. At what level in our hierarchy? He said mesh. mesh. You're very, very close. What level inside of our hierarchy are we currently, or are we allowed to animate in? Item, item mode. We, we only animate items, right? So as a small little reminder, let me just write this on the board real fast. In 3D, 3D modeling and 3D animation, it's all about mastering and kind of manipulating hierarchies as all things in the computer. Okay, some things are more important than others, right? It's a hierarchy, and at the, the highest level inside of Moto is the item. Everything is an item first. This includes cameras, this includes lights, particle emitters, those are all items. This is the highest, highest uh, object inside of our hierarchy. And then when it comes to mesh items, and I'll put a, an M here for mesh, okay? We have a whole series of components. What are those component pieces? Yep, you got it. So we got polys. I heard you have hanging say edges and verts. Okay, these are component pieces. Okay, we use these components to construct the item itself. These are members of this container, if you will. As we get further into the Moto uh, animation and, and just the, the Moto animation system as a large, as a whole, you're going to find that certain items have other components that are different from vertices, edges, and polygons, okay? But they're all hierarchies, okay? We only animate at the item level, okay? We're only ever going to be animating items. We're never ever going to be grabbing a single polygon and moving it around the scene. Only items. Let's take a look at that for a second. So I jump back over into Moto, and uh, here's another thing that's, that's always been around in, in the 11 series, but they've made it more of, uh, of an important feature in 12. I like my tabs to switch between the layouts. Uh, there are actually a couple different ways to switch between the layouts. Um, i got to remember what it is. It's definitely not that. What is it? There's another, there's a... Keyboard shortcut that I am forgetting. Well, there's a keyboard shortcut that brings up a, a layout switcher inside of Moto, but I like the tabs. It's the fastest way for me to get around. Uh, and let's go into the Animate tab. Okay. Oh, if you take a look at it, um, there are some big changes happening to all of the layouts inside of Moto. Okay, specifically the, the largest and most obvious one VR. is VR. Okay. Uh, we don't have any. VR support in our, in our, on our campus, so this is kind of not important for us, but they've made some big changes, okay? So let's go over to the Animate tab and start checking this out a little bit. I'm going to zoom in here. 
and I'm going to turn off the visibility of my lights. Okay, that way everything is just kind of getting smooth shaded. And I'm also going to change the viewport shading model from shaded to default. Don't do advanced. Okay, don't do advanced. <laughs> uh, if you have one of those fancy new desktop, you know, workstation class graphics cards, then you can use the advanced layout or the advanced shading model, but we're on Open, open GL, so we got to use default. Okay? All right, so let's get this thing to move. Okay? We're in item mode. How do I start to manipulate an object in item mode? I want to move my teapot around a little bit. How am I going to move it instead of 3D space? The Y key. Now, there is a big difference between the W key, which is going to automatically fire off which tool? The move tool. And the Y key, which is going to fire off which tool? Yeah, it's all three, and it's technically called the item transform tool, the Y key. And so that you're, you're being really safe and incredibly secure with the objects that you're working with when uh, you hit the Y key. Okay? So now I know that I'm just working at item level. Okay? So I can move it around. Of course, the translation handles allow me to change the position. This also allows me to rotate it and then scale it out. Okay, hit undo for a couple seconds. All right. So now that I've selected my object and I've, and I've kind of refreshed my memory on how to move it around the, uh, on the scene, let's make the, the best animation on the face of the planet. Right? Award-winning animation is going to win me an Oscar, and I want to have my teapot move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. Let's walk through this animation process, and then we're going to start to decode exactly how the animation engine is doing this magic, right? Because seemingly it is magic, but it's not. It's not magic at all. There is a defined mechanical system on the back end that's driving the, the apparent translation of this object. So I want to put it over here into its starting position. Now what's next? Keyframe, Key right? Now, if you've taken GCOM 401 or any other animation class that we have here on campus, you know that keyframes have a big, big role inside of the animation production pipeline. However, if you're coming from GCOM 402, this is a foreign idea to you. So let's get everyone on the same page. What in the world is a keyframe? Yeah? When you, when you kind of just in the name, it's a frame in the animation that is uh, pivotal to the animation's movement. You got it. You got it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an important moment in time. We're saying at this moment in time, I want you to be, I want my character to look like this. Okay? I want my character to have a cool kung fu fighting move or something at this moment in time. Now for us in the computer animation world, I kind of translate that into my crazy mind as data. What we're doing in a keyframe is that we're capturing all the data channels that are associated with this object and we're storing it in a little white square. Okay? How do we make a keyframe? Inside of Moto. I love it. First day, I have no idea. Oh, oh you didn't take the animation class. So you're good. First, you have to decide what kind of um, movement or rotation or any kind of transforming you need. And then usually we set that to just fly. You got it. And Dominic's absolutely right. The first thing that we have to do is that we have to tell the computer which data to capture. We have to make some selection. Uh, of what's called animation channels. Okay? Now we're going to drive pretty deep into animation channels over the next couple of weeks, but on the surface you can see those animation channels right here inside of our animation layout. Okay? Now each row is a different part of our transform. The first row is position, the second row <coughs> excuse me, is rotation, and naturally the third row down there is all of our scale properties. Right now, if I was to hit the S key, which is the keyboard shortcut for making a keyframe from the selected channels, which channels, which animation channels would I create a keyframe for? Not all of them. Yeah, just that top row. How do you know it's just the top row? They're highlighted. It's orange. The background color is orange. It's a nice, good visual reinforcer that those are the channels that I'm, in fact, going to be keying. Okay? Now, we can change that if you'd like. So I can select them here. That's actually just doing the, uh, I apologize, just the handles on the object. Uh, but this next button will create keyframes 
for those selected channels. So if I just, I'm going to go back in time, hit undo. So if I just wanted to keyframe in the position, I can do individual channels. If I click it on the little radio button, bloop, the red dot on the channel indicator represents a keyframe. I can also remove it by clicking off of it. I can do all three channels at the same time by hitting that button. It's pretty cool. Okay. If you're mindful of the, the function of this part of your interface, okay, and I'm going to return to the Atom Transform tool, okay, it can make keying pretty fast. So if I hit the S key, since I had the Atom Transform tool on, it's going to key all three channels at the same time. Okay. So I've captured a keyframe. I've told the computer at this moment in time, I want this teapot to be way out over here. And it's physically capturing all of this data, all of these animation channel uh, details in the keyframe itself. Okay. Specifically, Moto represents keyframes on our timeline by this little white rectangle. Okay. So I've made one keyframes. Keyframes need to come in pairs uh, in order for the computer to make this move. Okay. What's the next step? or whenever we want that, the animation to end. Okay? I'm going to say that I want to have my animation end on frame 60. So I'm going to physically advance the playhead forward by clicking on the ruler markers down here in my timeline. Notice that I'm not clicking here. I'm clicking on the ruler markers to advance the playhead. So I'll go to frame 60. I could also enter in that value here if I'd like, but this is a good fast way of doing it. So I've moved the playhead physically forward in time, right? What's next? Move the teapot with it. Now we're going to move the teapot, right? And this is the part that a lot of folks kind of get hung up on the first, you know, three or four times when animating just as a whole, right? If you were to if you were to keep your playhead over here at frame zero, which already has a keyframe, okay, then move your teapot teapot to the right side of the screen you would overwrite the information that's on that, on that keyframe. We're capturing data, okay? We're capturing the teapot's position on the left side of the screen on this keyframe. I've advanced my playhead forward to ensure that I don't accidentally overwrite that other stuff, right? And now, with my playhead over here on frame 60, I'm free to move my teapot to where I want it to end its movement. Let's just do it real fast. Whoops, I'm all zoomed in, so it wigged out, sorry. There we go, over there like that. Now, if you look down at your timeline, some things have changed. A nice, again, visual reinforcer that animation is, in fact, happening between these two keyframes. This great little green bar, okay? Let's hit the play button down here and see how our animation's working out. We got a little cycle here in a second. Whoop. Ha ha. Just gave myself a high five. I did it. Right? Lucasfilm, here I come. I've been to the gates of Lucasfilm, by the way, Skywalker Ranch. I was a massive nerd. I am a massive nerd. I should just embrace it. When I was 18 or 19, I think I just moved here from, uh, from New Mexico. And being the super computer nerd and Star Wars nerd that I was, I made the pilgrimage, if you will, to Skywalker Ranch. I said to myself, I had a weekend free, I didn't have anything to do. And I was like, I'm going to see if I can find Skywalker Ranch. And I knew roughly where it, where, where it was. And I remember, this was you know, 25 years ago, right? And this was before Star Wars turned into Star Wars. <laughs> this was before the prequels and before it exploded in, uh, in franchise popularity. Um, and so finding Skywalker Ranch was a little bit of a problem. Uh, and I knew where it was. It's not a secret anymore. It's up Lucas Valley Road, right, you know, uh, over by San Rafael. And uh, it's quite, it's actually a very beautiful drive into the middle of, middle of nowhere. Uh, and I knew I had found it because it is like a palisade gate, right? It is just like this massive gate. And it says Skywalker Ranch. And there's like four security cameras outside the main gate. And I was like, I think this is Skywalker Ranch, right? And I was. There actually was a little sign that said Skywalker Ranch. So I waved to the security guard on the cameras, and then I hopped back in my little car and drove home. Anyways. Uh, okay, 
So we're animating now, which is pretty great. Things are working the way we want it to work. Let's go in and start exploring for a second how we can work with these keyframes, because these keyframes are an important part of our animation, our, our animation engine. Now, what physically are we doing on the back end of the computer database? This is an important idea. What are we physically doing, or what is the computer doing in between these two data points? Does anyone know what this process is called? Interpolation. Interpolation. Good job. Good job. These guys actually did listen to me in 401. I'm proud of that. Uh, interpolation. And this is where the computer is transitioning between this data point and this data point. Okay? If you think about it, and let's just kind of break it down. Let's see, my playhead is way over here on frame zero. Okay? How do I know it's on frame zero? You got it. It's highlighted in white, which represents the current location of the time indicator, the playhead, as it's referred to. Right now, I'm viewing all of the animation data that's in that keyframe. Notice in my channels, all I have little red radio, uh, red little dots and all the radio buttons. So I'm physically viewing the contents of my keyframes right now. And I can see that I've well, I know because of what I did. I just moved my object along or changed it, its position. And specifically, I think I just moved it along the Z axis. So the Z axis or the current location of this teapot and the Z axis is at 906 millimeters inside of our 3D workspace. Okay. Let's go forward to the next keyframe. There's a couple ways you can do that. How can I advance my playhead to the next keyframe? Arrow buttons are a good way of doing it. Which, which arrow buttons? Because there, there are a couple different arrow buttons down there at the bottom of our animation layout. It's not, though. The last frame of my timeline is frame 120. Yeah. If you know the number, you just type it in. That works? That's a good way of doing it? Yes. The one right next to the zero on the right. What is that one? These are going to advance. Right. Let's check it out. Yeah. There's a difference because there's another set of arrows to the right of uh, to our, our shuttle controls. That just does one frame at a time. And that one, the rightmost one, goes to the end of the of the sequence. Okay. However, check it out. It's kind of a little hidden one. A lot of folks don't see it. These guys over here, kind of the exact same thing, but notice the icon difference between the two. What's the big difference? Green. They're green and white. white cubes, right? White cubes inside of Moto mean keyframe. These are going to allow us to jump forward uh, and behind all of our next you know, keyframes. So I'm on currently frame 120. So I go to my first keyframe. This is next keyframe, and this is last keyframe. So I go, whoop, pops in. Great way to navigate through your keyframes, especially if you don't know the numbers or if you have a zillion of them, right? And with animation, you're often going to. All right, so on frame 60, let's look at the data that's been captured on this specific keyframe. Yeah, so 700. Negative 714 millimeters, OK? So we physically change the data that that keyframe has captured, right? On the previous keyframe, it was 906 millimeters. And now we're at 714. The computer is automatically going to change the position values for us in between those keyframes. That's called interpolation. So on frame two, let's go back to it. So on frame zero. It's 906. Say again? You got it. So on frame 60, red keyframe. Okay? We've saved that information inside of a keyframe. Okay? The green ones, no keyframe. It's just unedited data at this point, or uncaptured data, let's put it that way. So everything's 
was red. All the dots were red in the first two frames, and we moved it. And it just, if you just moved it on the Z axis, it's only changing one of those. It only changed the animation channel that changed. Okay. Or only keyed, excuse me, the animation channel that changed. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to frame one here. 906. And if I just step forward a little bit, let's see if I can capture this a little bit. I want you guys to look right here inside the interface. Let's see if I can do two things at once. Here we go. See how it's automatically changing the values? That's interpolation. It's transitioning from one data point to another data point automatically for us, okay, numerically. That's all it's doing. This is the root of computer animation. All animation systems, and it just doesn't matter if it's in After Effects, Toon Boom, Maya, Moto, Cinema 4D, Houdini, which is getting an awesome update, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, it, all animation systems work on this idea of interpolation. The computer cycling from one data point to another. This is the man behind the curtain. Computer animation is nothing more than transitioning between values. That's it. Okay, we're done. I'll see you in December. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit more than that, but that's at the that's at the root what we are doing. Okay. For me, this uh, you know animation became or computer animation got it became a whole lot simpler for me once that little light bulb came off. That I'm just cycling between values. Okay, um, it, it got simple for me. All right. So luckily for us, inside of Moto, we can animate along any number of our, our defined animation channels at one time. Now, we're just simply moving our object uh, from the left to the right. But naturally, we can add more animation into this uh, if we'd like. I think I want to have my pot move and then also spin at the exact same time. So here I am on the first keyframe of my animation. If you look down at the animation channels in the lower right-hand corner, everything is ready to rock and roll. I got keyframes for every single channel. That's cool. I like that. This is the start point, right? I want to animate the rotation channels. So I'm going to cruise over to frame 60 again. Notice that I haven't captured any rotation keyframes in this specific moment in time. So I think I want to have this thing spin kind of like a top as it goes through the entire scene. Pop quiz, hot shots. Which channel am I going to have to animate to get it to spin like a top? Y. 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 Rotation Y. So I think I want it to have, uh, let's just do, I don't know, one complete revolution. So I'll type in 360. Notice that it automatically went red. Now, why did it go red? Yeah, you got it. It recognized, the animation system recognized that on this specific animation channel, there was already previously created another keyframe, okay? So we only have to hit that S key one time, if you will. All other times, it's going to do what's called auto keying for us, where we'll automatically generate a keyframe if the system already recognizes that there's a keyframe on that animation channel, which is pretty cool. It makes animation a little bit more fluid, okay? We're not always, you know, we're not always coming down and hitting that big radio button or hitting the S key. Let's look at what the engine's done for us. I'll return to the first frame of my animation and hit the play button. Whee! There it goes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Now, of course, we can do this with the scale if we want. Okay. I'm not going to go through all of them because I think it's kind of redundant. But let's start looking for a second at what is actually animating. Because on an object like our teapot, it's kind of deceiving because it, it feels on the surface that we're just moving our polygons around. But we're not actually moving our polygons around. There's a different, there's some additional components to our animation engine that are truly driving the animation of our little teapot. Now this isn't something that we went over uh, in, in too much detail in other animation classes, so this is kind of our first step into the world of rigging. Okay? Animation happens at the item level, but it's not actually what's moving in our world, in the actual animation system itself. What's physically being animated, what's physically is responsible for the, the illusion that we've created is the pivot point. Okay? The pivot point, and let's just uh, maybe change some things here. So let's select my item, and I believe pivot points are six. Yeah. Let me just confirm that. 
I want to make sure I'm speaking correctly. Yeah, pivot point six and then center point is seven. Okay, the pivot point, okay, let's go back to the animation tab. So I'll select it, hit the six key to bring open my pivot point. That right there, that's truly what's animated, what we are animating when we are changing these animation channels. Okay, that's the thing that's moving. Okay, our polygons are just kind of coming along for the ride. They're being dragged through the scene by that pivot point. Where the pivot point goes, so does our model. Everything is around the pivot point. It's the root of our animation engine. Okay. Now I have my pivot point. Uh, active, and if you're not seeing the pivot point for your object, here's kind of a, a good production uh, practice to go through. I'm going to zip over into item mode, so I've hit the number five key. I've selected my item, and now I hit six. You're only going to see the pivot point when you filter your scene by a selection, and then hit the six key. We've got to tell the computer which pivot point to show, okay, by an initial item selection. All right, so now with my pivot point visible. Let's play it, and you can see that it's actually moving and spinning and the whole deal. Okay? It's a little difficult to see at the moment uh, its rotation because it's spinning around the y-axis. Let's make it very, very visible and rotate our object once again by along, uh, let's do the x-axis. So we'll have it spin 360 degrees on x. There it goes, and now we can see it spinning and rotating a little bit. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so what would happen if we went in and started changing the location of our, of our pivot point? Let's check it out. It's actually pretty cool. We can do this. The pivot point is not a static item inside of our scene. We can go in, we can select our pivot point. Notice once again that we have uh, get the nice, nice little orange highlight color in the background. Now I can hit the, the W key. Let's change the pivot point's location to something like this. With the pivot point offset from the mesh, watch what happens. Interesting, huh? What's happening here? You got it. You got it. The pivot point, the location of the pivot point represents the actual animation data that we've, that we've captured in those keyframes. Okay? So by offsetting, by moving the pivot point away from the item itself, we're changing where the polygons are moving around. Point being, the polygons are being dragged through our scene. Okay? The pivot point is truly what's responsible for determining where and how our objects are going to be animated inside of our scene. Now there's actually, one of the great things about the pivot point is that we can, this is high level thinking and it's kind of, kind of crazy once we start breaking it down, we can actually animate the location of a pivot point too, which is pretty cool. Okay? Let me show you a great visualization of this idea. All right? um, I'm going to get rid of this item, this teapot. Over in the animation layout, these two buttons here will expand and collapse certain parts of the animation layout. This one's going to show the item list. Okay. See how it just pops it in and out, which is pretty cool. Now I'm going to nuke, get rid of this entire item. Bloop. Bye bye. Okay. And on a new item, I'm going to add in just a simple cube. Okay. Just a unit primitive cube, literally nothing too fancy. Okay. Now here's the challenge that we have in front of us, and I'm going to let you guys kind of experiment and explore this a little bit too. I want to try to get my cube to rotate across the scene as if it's being pushed, you know, at the top, so it's going to be rotating around its bottom corner, okay? To help visualize this and to make it a little bit more, a little bit more obvious, let's do this. On my other empty mesh item, uh, I'm going to add plane. There it is. And I'm going to scale it up so it's quite big. There it is. And I'm going to grab my cube in item mode now because at this, at the animation level, we always, always, always animate at item level. And being a nerd, I'm going to get some accuracy. It's actually just 500 
millimeters. There we go. Okay, so now that cube, it's kind of hard to see. Let's do this. I'm going to throw those polygons into a material. Hit the M key. Let's call this red. There we go. Now it's a little bit easier to see. So I want this cube to kind of rotate and flip over as if it's going like, as if it's on the ground. Like someone's like pushing the cube and it's going flop, 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 flop. That would be a pretty difficult animation to do, right? If you think about it. Because here's what we'd ultimately have to do without uh, the assistance of, of the pivot point. If I went into item mode, selected this guy, and just started my animation, notice where the translation handles are. Look very carefully. Where are the translation handles? At the pivot point, okay? Our little move and rotate and scale indicators are always going to show up at the pivot point, okay? If I was to move it, move the pivot point, hit the 6 key, move it down here. I'm all zoomed in, so it's wigging out. Excuse me. And I'm just going to do this visually. Okay, there we go. And go back into item mode, and then once again, hit the item transform. Now, where is the translation handle showing up? At the location of the pivot point. The pivot point is really what we're editing and changing when we're animating items inside of Moto. Now, this animation becomes a little bit easier for me, right? In addition, I'm just going to take this guy, move the pivot point way over here. Okay. That's close enough, close enough for government work. Yeah, Kevin's got it. Now when we go back to item mode, hit the 5 key, select my cube, Y key for item transform, check it out. Now I can, I can go clunk. Okay. Let's do it. This is driving me crazy. I'm an old school guy. All animation timelines for me start on frame 1, not on frame 0. All right, here we go. So on frame one, let's just lock down this animation. I'm going to rotate this guy. So I'm going to rotate along the X. So to key that in. Okay. Now let's go forward, I don't know, 10 frames. So now it's going to rotate for 10 frames. Where was it at? Uh, let's do negative 90. All right. Now, I'm going to have it sit static for 10 frames. So it's going to rotate, stop for a second, and then rotate again. So I'm going to add, I'm going to go forward in time to frame 20 and then just add another keyframe. I'm not going to change this value, okay? When two keyframes on our timeline have the exact same value, it's not going to move. This is negative 90, and this is negative 90. So it's not going to move in here. It's going to stay static. However, on frame 30, I want to have it rotate again. But I want it to rotate around this location up here in the front leading edge of the cube. Okay? If I leave the pivot point where it is, this is what I'm going to get, which is not what I'm after. Okay? The cool thing about pivot points is that we can change them. Select it, 6 to get access to our pivot point. And these have their own animation channels on the back end. Okay? The timeline's currently not showing it to it, but they are there. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, go to frame, let's see, on frame 20. Yeah, I'm going to go to frame 19, okay? And I'm going to preserve, I'm just going to hit the, the W key. Now we're seeing the timeline and all the keyframes for the translation of the position of our pivot point. And I'll simply hit the S key. So that keyframe has locked in the pivot point at that location. Now if I go forward one frame to when I want this animation to begin its rotation, I'm simply going to move it over there. Okay. Now, no one's ever going to see a one frame change in its location. However, let's go back to the cube. I think I messed up its placement. Let's, uh, let's go back. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, I'm on frame 21. My bad. I'm totally messed it up. I didn't put it in the right spot. 
I could absolutely snap it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going down that rabbit hole at the moment, but that's absolutely an option. There it is. Okay, so on frame 30 now. Yeah. Oops, I clicked off it on accident. There it goes. Boom. A very difficult animation without changing and animating the location of the pivot point. A very easy animation when we start going in and leveraging the power of this pivot point. So here's what I want you guys to do real fast. And we're just going to take 10 or 15 minutes to do this. I want you to practice this. I want you to build what I just built real fast and get used to selecting an item, hitting the six key to expose the pivot point, animating the pivot point to make your cube kind of flop, flop like we just did. Okay? Race it, go. Question? Yeah. Okay. So when I hit six, it's reflex. It's ah, reflex these six up here. The number pads are going to change your viewport shading model. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the top row keys are going to change, change all this. <laughs> I got my shift primitives coming in. It's a little dark here. I think it's because they're inverted. It's because they're shaded. I've got yeah. to change that yep. for mode.
Okay. All right. So looks like everyone's going to kind of get the hang of it, right? This at the root is what our animation is all about. It's animating animation channels, manipulating pivot points to get the uh, to get the rotation where we want it to go. Okay. Um, I'll be honest with you. This is kind of the level that we're going to be working in. Okay. Technical, right? This is rigging where we ha we're going into the back end of Moto. Okay, and it's only going to get more difficult as we go along through the semester. Okay, um, so point being, leverage the power of the live streams is a great way for you to go back in and get a refresher and a good visualization of the steps that I went through during class to support your homework and your animations that you're doing. Okay, um, I have a lot of learning resources that I'm going to be exposing you guys to over the next 16 weeks that are dedicated towards rigging. Okay. Um, so let's take another step forward. Now that we understand the power of the pivot point and how the animation system works, let's start making our first rig. Okay? And for this week's homework assignment, you guys are going to rig, animate, and render a small swinging chain animation. Okay? Now if you think about it, for a swinging chain, there's a complex network of items that we need to be able to control. Because a chain isn't just a static little stick that's swinging on a pendulum, right? We want to have a nice curve and bend to our chain to simulate the effects of gravity and the forces that are being applied to each one of those chains, chain links inside of our animation, right? So we're going to need to have some sort of control rig that will facilitate this goal, this movement. And if you go back over to Canvas real fast, I provided you with an excellent example as to the goal of this, okay? I'm under the animated chain assignment sheet over here in Canvas. And this is it. This is the goal. This is what we're trying to achieve. Okay. Notice that all the chain links are rotating around the bottom part of the link above it. Okay. That's the goal. Okay. This is what this is the target. So how are we going to create a rig that allows us to create this movement? Jump back over to Moto and start talking about the next element inside of our animation system, and that is, of course, or the excuse me, the first relationship inside of our Moto animation system, and that is, of course, the parent-child relationship. We need to have ten links on the chain here. Okay, I've provided you with one. You don't have to use this chain link if you don't want to. If you want to make your own chain link, I say more power to you. But I've given you the model that we're going to start our animation from. You can find this in the body of our assignment sheet. It's kind of towards the bottom. You'll notice that uh, on almost all the assignments coming from this class, I'm going to give you some expectations. I'm going to give you an example of what the rig and of what the animation should look like at the conclusion of this work. And then there's almost always some resources that you'll need to download to do the work. Okay, so here's the actual project file, the chain link project file. I've simply saved it to my desktop and I've opened up that LXO. So that's this is what you download, this is what you get when you, when you open up the archive, and this is what the project file looks like when you open it up. So I've only given you one of the ten links that you're going to have to have. So immediately right off the bat, what should you be thinking about? We're going to have to duplicate these bad boys. I need ten different chain links. Okay. Also, understanding that each chain link is going to have to be animated individually, what type of duplication are you going to be doing? Item duplication. Okay. Remember, anything that needs to be animated individually has to be in its own item. Okay. Everything in the animation based or animation is item based. Okay. So I, what I can't do is simply go grab the polygons. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, like we've done in like GCOM 402 when we're doing duplication at that level. Here, at the item level, we have to be a little bit more careful. So in every sense, this is what you're not supposed to do. Okay? <laughs> Don't go in, hit the three key, and be like, oh, I'm just going to select the polygons, copy, command C to copy, command V, fire off the move tool, move it down. Oops, looks like I didn't do that. Let's try that again. Edit, copy. Edit, paste, there we go. Fire off the move tool. Now I have two. Don't do this. Okay, this is this is no bueno. Visually, it may look like a chain, but this isn't gonna work inside of our animation system. Let me visualize why this isn't gonna work. 
As I mentioned earlier, these two buttons are going to expose additional components of the animation layout. Let's look at our item list. Right now in our item list, the only contents of our scene is one mesh item that's called chain, a camera, and a light. What, do we, what is our ultimate goal here? Ten different mesh items. Okay. There's a number of different ways you can do it. You certainly could do item clone. At the, at the, at the very least, here's where we should go. And I'm going to help you out. I'm going to do two of these for you. Okay, you're welcome. So I'm going to go back in time, hit undo a couple stages. Okay, so at the very least, here's what we need to do. Okay, right click, duplicate. This is going to duplicate the hierarchy or excuse me, duplicate the item. There we go. And now I have chain two. If we examine the contents of our item list, here's the first one, here's the second one. Okay. If I hit the Y key, you can see that there are actually two different, two different pieces in here. Let's rotate this 90 degrees. And we're starting to look how we want to look. Okay. I find that character rigging, or just rigging in general, gets a whole lot easier when we start thinking about the goal first. Okay? Rigging is stupid hard if we're trying to make it up as we go along. Right? It gets a whole lot easier if we have a target that we're aiming for. Okay? So point being, think through the entire animation first. What do we need this rig to do? There are no super rigs. There's not a rig that's going to do every single thing on the face of the planet. The rig is only going to do what we command and tell it and create it to do. Okay? It's not going to do more and it's not going to do less. It's purpose built, each rig. Okay? So let's think about the function of this rig. What do we want this rig to do? What, is, what are the literal moving pieces that we need to kind of, kind of zero in on? I like Sophia's hand gestures. That's a great place to start. It really is. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting there at my desk going, hmm, 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 huh, huh, huh. I want it to move like this, and then I need to go up like that, and then I want it to move like that. You know, that, it, it helps, helps us kind of wrap our, our, our brain around the problem. Okay? So Sophia's doing a wave like that. I like it. So what is that? What's the next logical step? Okay. How are we going to get that wave motion? That arc and that bend in the chain. I like it. So let's figure out where we want all these separate items to rotate to and from, and where inside of our 3D scene we want that rotate to happen, right? So it makes sense for a chain that we need to have the second link rotating around the bottom of the first link, right? kind of helps simulate gravity, which is a core principle of animation. We're always trying to simulate gravity. So with that said, if that's the desired result here, where should we move the pivot point? You got it. So like right here. Yeah, right in there. I apologize if it's tough. So this is where we want to have the pivot point. So that this link, the one that's selected, is going to rotate right around there at the bottom. Okay. So now that we have an idea of where we want the rotation to happen, we can the next step is pretty easy. Okay. Now we're just going to go in, change the pivot points location and we're up and running. Okay. So, walk me through it. I have my item selected. How do I change the location of its pivot point? Of chain link 2's pivot point. It's 6. It's 6, right? 6 on the top row of numbers. Some folks were hitting the number the number pad. Different set of commands, right? Top row, bloop, there it is. Now, check it out. It's way up here. That's interesting, isn't it? Why is it way up there? Yeah, let's examine a couple things here. Now, the first thing that we did is that we started with this one, right? And we duplicated it. Let's examine the location of this feller's pivot point. Hmm. Interesting, huh? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So you're showing that because you duplicated the original chain model and the pivot point is in the center of the top one, when you duplicated the other one to a different item, the pivot point was 
still in the center of the top one. Bingo. I didn't have that happen. Well, okay, good. Pivot point moved it moved with it. So yeah. Was that just sometimes what you said there? The big picture idea is you got to really look at your center, your pivot points. Okay. You really got to look. Okay. Sometimes they'll move with it. I've noticed in this case is a great example. Sometimes it won't. Um, so I'm going to move mine. Let's get that down there where you want it to go. Yep. Now that I've made a change to the rig, let's do this. Let's test it. Yeah, OK. We're up and running. Now we're getting the rotation that we're, that we're loosely after. It rotates that way, which is nice. It rotate, rotates that way, which is nice. OK. We're up and running. However, when I rotate this one at the top, when I'm starting my animation, I certainly don't want it to rotate there. So let's change its pivot point real fast. I think I want it to rotate up here. And I'm just doing this quick. OK, there we go. OK. Now when I rotate that first one, what we want to have happen? What would make it a whole lot easier for our animators to, to work with this rig? <laughs> somehow, or I think a little bit more broadly, that the chain links were linked somehow. So that when you move the top chain link, the ones underneath it also move. Okay, That's the goal. This is our first rigging relationship. We're going to connect two items together. We're not going to connect their animation channels, but we're going to make a relationship. We're going to send information between the two different items. Okay, This relationship, the most simple relationship, is called a parent-child relationship. Okay, The way I always imagine a parent-child relationship is kind of like a... <laughs> I have two kids. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old at home. Okay. And uh, they are wonderful human beings, the center of my universe. But going out to like the grocery store is uh, a challenge, right? Because if you're, if you have ever had young children around, uh, they are like little Tasmanian devils, my boys. They really are, and I and I love them for their energy. But at times, just going to the grocery store to get some milk takes like an hour, <laughs> right? Because they're little Tasmanian devils, they're just running all over the place, right? Uh, but Wherever the parent goes, okay, so goes the child, right? I go to the grocery store, the child comes with me to the grocery store. However, the child is free to move around inside the confines of the grocery store a little bit, okay? So wherever the parent goes, the child goes too. However, we still can manipulate the child independently from the parent, okay? Let me show you what this looks like. Creating a parent-child relationship is wicked easy, and there are a couple different ways. Let me show you the easiest way of making this parent-child relationship. I'm going to go, uh, let's see, I, I'm on chain link number one. And with the item list open, you actually get access to the same animation channels, the same animation properties that we are used to seeing downstairs in our animation control set. So 48 degrees, remember that value? If we go downstairs, bum, 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 what do we see? 48 degrees. It's literally the same information, just displayed in two different ways. Okay. I'm going to zero out the rotation on chain link number one to get it back to its resting pose. Okay. So everything's back, ready to go. I really recommend you make these relationships before you start moving them around. Okay. Creating a parent-child relationship inside of Moto is really, really easy. The easiest way to do it is to do it in the item list. If we go over, uh, I'm going to grab what's going to be the child. This is the parent. And I'm going to left click and drag it on top of the parent. Notice that we get this orange bar. Okay, go away. Orange bar. Okay. When I mouse up, bloop, it creates a relationship. Think of these like nested folders on your operating system. It behaves very, very similar to that idea. We now have a hierarchy. This little disclosure arrow will show us the relationship between all the contents of this hierarchy. So this is our first, our first, uh, our first relationship. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. 
That's it. So chain link number three is going to be chain, or it's going to be parented to chain link number two, right? Let me show you what this parent-child relationship looks like now that we have it created. If I grab the parent, which is chain link number one, fire off the atom transform tool and rotate it. Aha! Oh, look at that. Now the child comes along for the ride. Okay. Its rotation channels are being influenced, modified by the rotation channels of the parent. Okay. However, we haven't shut down chain link number two. It's still a live player inside of our scene. If I grab chain link number two, I can still move it independently from its parent. Welcome to your first rig. This is it. Okay. So your job, your mission this week is to make a rig, a control rig for your chain. Ten chain links, okay, all parented together and animated to create the illusion of that lovely little swing. Okay. I'm going to start off simple. Okay. Start off simple. Like I said, you're more than welcome to use this rig. You don't have to if you don't want to. If you want to be creative, go crazy. Um, but this is where this is where we're going. A couple ideas about the uh, about this project that I want to make sure that everyone's aware of. Like I said, got to have ten links. Okay. Um, we're not going to actually. I'm going to. Don't worry about control surfaces. We're going to we're going to move that to next week. Okay. Let's start talking about control surfaces next week. Um, I want you to make this a good render. So materials and textures for everything. Okay. It's important that we take every opportunity to make pretty pictures, okay? Even as something as simple as a silly little chain animating. This is week one, so it's just kind of, like I said, shaking all the rust off and remembering how to do all this, right? So your animation duration is going to be 10 seconds, and we're going to be rocking and rolling with 24 frames a second. Please put a background in there. Do not do this. I put that in there as an example to show you how ugly and how difficult it is to see things when they're completely enveloped by a black background. Okay? It's very difficult to get separation between the foreground the black, and the background when it's black. Very difficult. So no black backgrounds. Put a, and put an environment map in there. Okay? Use one of those great environment presets. It's super simple to create that. Okay? Yeah, if you, you know, I'm never going to say no for you guys going above and beyond the expectation. easier than that. But actually, I was going to talk about rendering a little bit, because okay. uh, some of you guys haven't rendered animations in here. Um, if, you've, if you're coming from GCOM 402, we've only rendered still images in the 3D modeling class. We haven't really spent any time rendering animations. So this next part is for those students specifically. And you know, it's a good idea to have a refresher on, on all of this. Now, the final render type, this is important. Okay? The final render type is going to be an MP4. Okay? Now, when we're rendering animations out of Moto, how are we rendering them? And this is not a Moto thing. This is an industry-wide thing. If you're doing this in Maya or in Cinema 4D, you're still rendering what? Someone said it, and you're right. Image sequences. Okay? We're always, always, always going to be rendering an image sequence. And I want to kind of remind everyone what that process looks like, because it is a process. Okay? Now, let's. Uh, I'm going to create. Just a very, very simple scene here with my chain links. Okay. So here's my scene. Of course, we're going to do all of our render setup and rendering in the rendering layout. Let's compose the shot. That's good. Fire off a preview, and that's what we get. Okay. You know, maybe I should revise my assignment sheet and say no black backgrounds but certainly not a gray gradient background as well. The, the default environment instead of Moto is just absolutely horrific, right? So let's explore the render properties real fast and, and kind of uh, get re-familiar with uh, getting everything out of Moto and into an image sequence. Um, of course, all of, our, all of our render setup happens down inside of our shader tree. Okay? The shader tree is going to expose all of our render properties here in the render item. That's officially what it's called, the purple sphere thing. This is the render item. Remember going back to our conversation at the beginning of class that everything is a hierarchy inside of Modo, but at the top of all of those hierarchies is an item, 
Okay? Same goes for our rendering setup. We have a render item that has a whole series of components. So we can see some of those components here in render outputs, materials, and shaders. So let's look at the render item properties. And I always like to start here, the frame width and the frame, and frame height. Okay, this is going to determine the size of the image that we create. Now, if you still have your assignment sheet open, what size are we going to be rendering, rendering to for this assignment? 1280 by 720. 1280 by 720, so we have to change this. Okay, I don't know why the powers that be at the foundry, <laughs> I, I really don't know why they did this. They, they returned the default frame width and height back to 720 by 480, which is a step backwards for me. In the 11 series, the, yeah, in the 11 series it was 1280 by 720, but I guess that's not horrible. We just got to remember to go in and change it. 1280 by 720. Okay. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. Now it looks like a rectangle. Okay, I'm being an artist and making something a little bit more engaging. I apologize. Okay. So we get a preview of what the final render is going to look like. Let's go in and start applying some maybe materials to make it look a little bit more compelling uh, than what we have here. Materials happen at the component level, right? So if I select my, poly or my item here, and then simply hit the number three key to enter into my polygonal component selection set. You can double click on those polygons. What's the magic keyboard shortcut that creates a material associated with those polygons? M. M, M for material. And uh, I don't know. Let's I'll keep it red. Why not? Now, I want both chain links to have the same red color. So now, I'm going to return to this item so I get to access its contents. Double click on it in polygon mode and also assign the red material. And there we go. Okay. Now, I mentioned earlier that I want you guys to put a background in there, something fun. Okay. Uh, you're more than welcome to go out there online and find some backgrounds. Here's a great resource, really, really, really great resource. Something that I personally I, I have used a number of times recently. Yeah, it's really good. It's a pay what you want resource, resource for backgrounds called HDRI Haven, H-D-R-I Haven. I'm not sure what the URL is. Ah, it's just hdrihaven.com. I, I have everything bookmarked at home. Uh, this is really cool. It's a pay as you, pay what you want. So if you don't want to pay this guy anything for supplying you with great environment maps, you don't have to. <laughs> However, if you're a professional and you're making money off of this, go buy that dude a cup of coffee. He's giving you a lot of content, okay? Um, I mean, check out all the stuff that they have. It's under the HDRIs. It's really good stuff. Like, I feel bad only paying like $5 for one of these maps because I would pay this dude a whole lot more. Um, these are really cool maps. So these are the spherical 360 degree images that will go in the backgrounds of our, of our, object, uh, of our scenes. I mean, they're just really cool. And they're all under the Creative Commons license, so you really can use, I mean, you can use these commercially, which is kind of fun. Uh, and many of the you know, pay-what-you-want sites, it's like, yeah, you can get these for free, but if you're using them commercially, pay the dude, right? Pay the dude. That's, that's, how, uh, you know, that's, that's how the professional community works. And here's some backplates, too, which are kind of fun. So if you wanted to composite this into uh, one of these images, you certainly could. Anyways, it's a good resource. Check it out. I've downloaded many of these personally and used them in some projects recently, and they're quite good. All right. In addition, let's see if computer services have put our presets in. If you go to the Render Preset Browser and into the Assets section, uh, I take that back. No, yeah, here it is. Environments. And let's do the Smart Eyeball ones. These are cool. And I don't know. Let's just pick... Let's do uh, Tokyo Subway. Double clicking on it will load it in. Now, does anyone know why it's being clipped here? It's the shadow catcher. All of these smart eyeballs and these render presets come with what's called a shadow catcher. Yeah, which is basically just a gigantic plane. Here it is right here. And you can move it. You can move it down. There we go. And the shadow catcher's sole function is just to create a shadow on top 
of that background. Yeah, see how we're getting the shadow now? That's cool. All right. So I've created some materials. I've put a fun background in there. For this assignment, you know, some of the ones in the, in the render preset browser that I would honestly recommend, uh, check it out. These smart eyeball ones are really kind of cool. There's a lot of good ones in here. Um, and uh, the studio ones are pretty neat too. There's a lot of really great studio presets that I would honestly recommend that you use for a simple little animation like this. Okay. Like the low, example, you want to spin uh, the image map? Well, uh, resizing mostly, because I mean, the, it's a really big change. It is, yeah. Um, resizing, no. We can't scale the image map in the background, okay? Um, we can rotate it, okay? Like, for example, on mine, if I go in and da -da -da -da, it's in the environment section in your shader tree. So these smart eyeball ones actually come with three different environments. Let's just do the background one. Here it is. Here's the actual image that's being loaded into the background of my render. And you can see that they have, under the texture locator, it's at 90 degrees. So right now I can see this really cool sign in the background. If I put it at zero, yeah, now I'm seeing a different part of the image. We're just, we're just spinning, it's like a sphere. It really is just a sphere. And we're spinning the sphere along the y-axis to change what we see in the background. All right, so this is pretty cool. Uh, this is a setup for our render. How do we actually render something? Because we haven't, we haven't made a picture yet. Rendering is all about asking the computer to make a picture for us. We've set up some parameters. We get a cool preview of what that pr picture is going to be. But how do we actually render it? Yeah. They, they've moved some stuff around. If, you're, if you remember from the 11 series, the layout of all the buttons up at the top are, well, they're a little bit different now. They've added access to some stuff in the render layout. But right here, F9, bloop. Render engine is going to take over, and we're off to the races. Aha. However, we're rendering an animation, right? We're not rendering just one picture. We're rendering out each individual frame separately. So how do we do that? Let's actually create just some silly little animation here. So we have a point of reference. And yes, you can actually animate everywhere. You don't, you're not limited to animating in just uh, That's good enough. Oops. I'll do 10 frames. There we go. There's my silly little animation. Let's compose the shot a little bit differently. So at least we kind of get something fun. Oh, good enough. OK, so there's the shot. I need to render out frames 0 through 10. Am I going to sit there and do frame 1, render, then when it's done, move the playhead forward, frame 2, render? Am I going to do that? No. <laughs> that is what you call a monumental waste of time. Luckily, the, the, the developers down at the Foundry have done us a solid. And if we return to the top of our screen, what we don't want to do for animation is hit that button. Okay, that's only ever, ever, ever going to render a still picture, an individual frame. We want to render out an image sequence. We can only do that by exploring the contents of the render pull-down menu. And what we're after is render animation. This is going to give us a, a series of, of options and a, and a little popover. Now, this is also something that you need to be very, very, very aware of. These are the defaults. It doesn't matter what your sequence settings are. It's just automatically going to have the first frame be 1, the render 2 frame be 120. My first frame of my animation is frame 0, so I want to put that to 0. And the last frame of the animation that I want to render out is going to be frame 10. 
Now, what is the frame step? Increment. Increment. So right now, it's going to frame, render frame 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If I was to change the frame step to 2, what would it render? 0, 2, 4. Yeah, so it's going to do every other. So if I put that to 3, it's going to do every third, so on and forth. Personally, I've never done that. Like, I, I have never run into a situation where I was like, I need to render every other frame, you know? <laughs> and this has never happened to me before. Um, there are better ways of doing it by draft. Yeah. There are better ways if you need to draft. No, because then all, your durations are going to be off. It's all going to be off. Yeah, because it's just going to render it. Yeah, you, I, I just, if you need a draft quality, there are ways to strip the render item down to its most basic moving parts and pieces and get pretty decent render times. That could be, that could be a, a, a potential place to do it. One of the things they added in the 12 series of Moto that I'm really happy that they're doing is frame range. And this is something for me personally, I was shouting to the heavens when they added this feature in. Because what this allows to do, and this is a big difference in the 12 series, what this allows you to do is say, I want you to render frames 1 through 30, 62, 68, 70 through 91. So we get to determine which frames inside of our animation sequence that we want to pop out. This is awesome if you have render errors. Okay, I was rendering something last semester, and the render crapped out, and I had some render errors on, you know, frames every once in a while, right? Uh, and it just turned into, it turns into a logistical nightmare having to go back in and render certain frames, ranges of frames. So this is a great feature to have in there. Anyways, OK. And finally, we want to make sure that we're saving an image sequence. OK, we'll talk about this render pass group as we advance on into the future. But let's hit OK. It's going to ask us for a destination. I'm going to put these around on my desktop. We'll just call these test. And I like PNGs. This is just me, though. The render engine is going to take over, and boof, we're off the races. So it finished frame one. Now it's on to frame two, so on and so forth. It's going to simply just advance up to each individual render frame as it uh, finishes the one that it's currently working on. If we jump back over to the desktop, you can actually start to see all of my frames pop in. Now we have a little bit of a problem here. Okay? If we look at the actual image that it creates, uh-oh. So yay, we've, we made a picture, but what's gone? Background. Ooh, the background is gone. Actually, it's not gone. Okay? We don't need to freak out. In the Moto rendering environment, the background is always going to show up in the transparency channel. So if you take a new, like Photoshop, Okay, in the Im our image editing class, we talk a lot about that alpha channel, that transparency channel. Moto saves all of the background information to that alpha channel. And Preview, Apple Preview, is doing, is doing a darn good job of showing us that alpha channel. I don't necessarily want that alpha channel, okay? especially for a background. If you want to make life simple, here's what I would recommend that you do. And I'm going to stop my render. Oh, it's actually done. I'm going to nuke all these. If you don't want, if you want to always see your background, look, return to your shader tree and simply either deactivate or delete your alpha output. Problem solved. And now when we render, render, animation, same thing, same thing, same name. eventually it's going to turn into an MP4, and you'll see why. Okay? We always render an image sequence first, and then we have to convert that image sequence over into, into an MP4. Now, what's the reason why we do image sequences? Why go through this extra step? Yeah. It's, just, it's always going to be one big, one big clot of information. Let me see if I have it with me. I don't know. It does, yeah. 
Let's see. Don't know. Yeah, OK. So this is, you'll see this animation again in the future. OK, this is a, a project that I worked on, I think, last year, this time last year. And uh, it's a great example of how the render engine creates problems for us. OK, this is something I modeled and textured and rendered right here in Moto. You'll see this when we start talking about rendering at the conclusion of the semester. And on the surface, you're probably like, oh, this is sweet. Is it? Yeah. Look at the, the grate of the fan. Right there. Do you see it? What, what, what did it look like to you? Flashing little boxes. OK, I'll see if I can find specifically a frame. There's one. There's a couple that are really bad. Yeah, there's one with two, specifically these here. Those are render errors. Okay, That's when the computer didn't get the right information from that bucket in the render, and it rendered that part of the frame, that part of the picture, incorrectly. It's a render error. Happens all the time. <laughs> in every rendering package, it happens all the time. There's always mistakes. We're asking the computer to do quite a lot. Okay. And many, 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 many times, it's going to mess up. Okay, So when we render out an image sequence, what's the solution to my problem? Re just re-render that one frame. Now I just have to go back, find out specifically which frame the computer rendered wrong. Um, let's see, I'm on, well, right about, you know, I don't know, was that frame or about seven seconds in or nine seconds in? So let's just call it right there in nine seconds. I go find that frame in my image sequence, and then I tell Moto, just render that one frame. And then I'd overwrite that file inside of my, uh, inside of my folder. Oof, I solved my problem. That's the power of image sequences. We don't have to re-render the entire animation. This is a good 300 frame render. It took some time to render this, OK? I think in the, and this is actually, believe it or not, this is the low quality version of the render. Okay, in the high quality version of the render, I think it took about 25 minutes, 26 minutes per frame. You times that by 300, that's a lot of rendering. Okay, so we don't want to have to redo these renders over and over and over again when there's a when there's a mistake. Not if there's a mistake, when there's a mistake. Image sequences preserve all the data that we that that's good. Okay. Um, in addition, when you're rendering out an image sequence, you saw this a second ago when I was rendering. The moment it's done rendering that one frame, it saves it to the disk. Okay? When you're rendering out a QuickTime movie, it doesn't save the file, permanently save the file, until you are completely done with 100% of the render queue. Okay? So if you're rendering out 300 frames, it's not going to save that QuickTime file until frame 300 is rendered. Okay? Bingo. Yep, you got it. And in the context of this class, and remember, last semester, these machines were randomly turning on and off, right? I was doing a big render, and I, was, I intentionally waited last semester until spring break, because I knew no one was going to be in this room, and I was going to render something the entire week, because I needed every single machine in here, and uh, it was going to be a big render. It was a big shot. It was like a 30-second shot, right? At 24 frames a second. That's a lot of frames, right? 720 frames. That's a lot of frames. Guess how many frames I was able to render? Yeah, about 100, OK? Because <laughs> about 100 frames in, the computer started turning off in here. And I went, are you kidding me? I came in that next day, and there were some colorful four little words that were spoken in this classroom, because I was really, really upset. And uh, However, I have about 100 frames that are good. When I re-render this thing again, I'm not going to render all the stuff that's been done. I'm just going to start where I left off, right? So when a computer crash happens, image sequences, you know, they save our bacon, OK? Because we don't have to go back in and re-render all that stuff over again, OK? All right, so that's why we do it. It's our safeguard. And it gives us a very, very flexible pipeline. And I mean extraordinarily flexible, OK? Because the product of all of this is not a QuickTime movie. It's actually 
an image. There it is. There's my hokey little image. Okay? They're just pictures now. I can edit and adjust these images like any other image. Okay? Someone noticed uh, earlier, I think it was Dominic, uh, that in my fan there is, yeah, there's a little, a little firefly that's happening down over here. Yeah, see it flickering? That drives me crazy. I don't know if you guys can see it. That's a firefly. That's just a, you know, that's just a reflection ray getting the wrong value and it's shining bright every once in a while when it's not supposed to be shining bright. Could be a spark. Either way, I don't want it there. Okay? So what did I do? I cloned that bad boy out. I didn't re-render it. I just went into After Effects just like we do over in Photoshop and I just cloned it out on every single frame and poof, problem solved. It took me about 10 minutes to solve that problem versus a going back into Moto, figuring out what's, which is going to cause the problem, re-rendering every single frame. Two days later, I have my result. Okay? Yeah, image sequences give us a tremendous amount of flexibility at, at the render stage. But we do need to get them into a movie format at one point or another. Because who wants to work with uh, you know, all of these? Okay? Because this is the, all the raw animation frames that came out of Moto. There they all are. Okay? You can actually kind of thumb through them and get a cool little flip book, you know, of what it looks like. Okay? Who wants to work with these? But we need to convert these into a QuickTime movie. Okay? Now, I have brought something, an example, that will show you how we're going to do, or what we're going to do. So, here is a render. Okay? A little teapot going across the scene. These are the raw animation frames that came out of Moto. Notice that on this one, the background is invisible. If you oops and forget to turn off your alpha channel when you render out a moto, don't worry. We can fix it. We can fix it. Okay? But it requires one additional sequence step inside of After Effects. Okay? So we're going to bring all of these animation frames, and there's, what, 60 of them. This is the goal. This is what we're trying to get to. Okay? We want to take all these animation frames and get them into a QuickTime movie. Okay? We do that in a couple different ways, but for today, I want you guys to get really comfortable working with After Effects. After Effects, at the professional level, this is our grand Swiss army knife, okay? If you're a graphic designer, everything is going to flow through either Photoshop or Illustrator. Those are the common denominators in, all, in that community, right? In our community, in the 3D world, After Effects is our common denominator. Everything runs through After Effects at one point or another, and it is an invaluable skill set. If you need an extra class this semester, GCOM 390 is an excellent one to take, which focuses all on motion graphics and After Effects. Okay? This is not a motion graphics class, but After Effects is a Swiss Army knife. It is the granddaddy tool for us in the motion business. So let's just open it up real fast. We're not going to do too much inside of After Effects, and it's really simple to do what we're after. It's a big app. Point being, it's going to take a while to load. Okay? I can sing a song while it loads. Do a little dance. No, I'm not going to do dance. An Irish jig? I think that's out of the question. <laughs> I love dance, though. My wife and I are big dance fans. She's the dancer. I'm the, I'm the, uh, the professional supporter of, of, uh, of dance. Uh, my wife taught dance for, for many, many years. If you ever want to see the cutest thing on the face of the planet, if, you, if you're having a bad day and you just need a guaranteed smile, come find me. I will show you three- and four-year-olds doing ballet. And there's nothing more adorable than seeing a whole bunch of three and four year olds all in their dance gear and their tutus doing, you know, like, it's just the cutest thing on the face of the planet. There was a question, and I want to make sure the questions get answered. No? Okay. So, welcome to After Effects. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a beast. It's our Swiss Army, Swiss Army knife. We're only going to use After Effects at the moment to import the image sequence and then to export an MP4. That's all we're going to do. Okay? To import things into After Effects, it's really easy. It's gonna, we're going to start over here. 
in the Project tab. And there's a couple different ways that we can import things into After Effects. Here's the easiest way, okay? File, Import, Files. On the surface, it might feel like you need to click on the second choice, right? Because you're thinking, oh, I have a whole bunch of these individual frames. I'm going to import in multiple files, right? No, just one. And After Effects is pretty smart. Remember, remember After Effects is purpose built for our industry, okay? So it, it, it's smart enough to understand the role of image sequences. Did you just get a random restart, Kevin? No, no okay, great. Whew. My heart uh, went a pitter patter there for a second. So I'm going to do file, import file. And I'm going to go find where I saved all of my image sequences. And doo -doo -doo. look at my flash drive name. <laughs> it's called Big Daddy because it's uh, I think it's uh, well it used to be the largest flash drive I had. Yeah, I think it, I, this is going to seem silly. I think it's only 16 gigs. <laughs> but at the time, I was like, yeah, I got a big one, right? That was like six or seven years ago. Anyways, and it just it's stuck. All right. So I've navigated to the folder where I have uh, saved all of my image sequences. So here's the part that people stumble on. Only click on the first one, OK? You don't need to select every single file. Just click on the first one, because After Effects is pretty smart. Check it out. It automatically recognizes that this is a sequence, OK? And it's going to load every single image in your sequence as one media file in After Effects. So you just need to click on the first one. After Effects is going to take care of the rest. We'll hit Open. Ta-da! There it is. We got one asset. But if you look at the image, the thumbnail, we're still missing that background. So if you forgot to turn off your alpha channel in Moto before you rendered, this is how you fix it. Admittedly, it, it's not obvious, okay? And if the developers at Adobe are listening to my live stream, you should fix this. Uh, if you right click on your asset, there's two things that we can do. We're gonna go into interpret footage and go to main. Doesn't make a lot of sense, right? A lot of folks think that you're doing something else, right? But if we go into our main interpret footage options, okay, there's two things that we're gonna change in here. First and foremost, under the alpha section, we're gonna ignore the alpha channel so we see our background. In addition, we also want the computer to assume a different frame rate. I animated this teapot and moto at 24 frames a second. And I want it to play back in After Effects at 24 frames a second. OK? That's all we need to do. Hit OK. Bloop. The thumbnail gives us a great illustration that that alpha channel has been ignored. And this part of your, of your browser is kind of like a little miniature Excel spreadsheet. There's actually a lot of information in here. But one of the things it shows you is the frame rate. And this, now we have a frame rate that matches what we animated over in Moto. So that's step number one. Step number two is that we have to create a composition from this guy. Okay. Uh, so here's the next part of this. It's really easy. Down here at the bottom of your project of your uh, project tab, you have this button. Okay. This is the icon for compositions inside of After Effects, and I'm simply going to grab this asset and drag it onto that button right there. Oof. Okay. And it creates a composition. You'll notice that your timeline now has become active. You can see your work over here inside the viewer. We're now actually using this asset as part of something that we can uh, animate inside of After Effects. But this is not an After Effects class. Just want to talk about how we can get this out into a format that uh, is usable for, for, for us as riggers. Okay? If you wanted to preview and see what it looks like, just hit the space bar. There's your animation. Ah. Like I said, wonderful animation, right? Let's get it out. There's one thing that we have to do. We need to make sure that this right here is selected. Because we're telling the computer this is the composition that we want to export. Then File, Export, and ex Add to Render Queue. Okay. We're going to use the After Effects rendering engine to pop out an MP4 because it is really easy. Later on in the semester, we'll start talking about 
the Adobe Media Encoder, which is a professional application that's designed to uh, compress and transcode video files and image sequences. Okay. But for today, and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to keep it real simple. Add to render queue. There's two things we need to change. This is going to be the name of the file and where you're going to save it to. Okay, so the destination. Click on not yet specified. Teapot animation. I want to put it on my desktop. File formats MOV. That's fine. And then the last thing we need to change is the output module. This is where it gets complex. And if you're new to this, definitely make sure you go back and watch the live stream. I've been live streaming this specifically so you guys have a reference point for it. If you click on the word lossless, there's really just one thing that we need to change. Okay? Under format options, the animation codec, the format options determines the codec, the math, if you will, that's responsible for, for determining the quality of our video files. The animation codec is awesome. It's almost an uncompressed image. It's fantastic. I use the animation all the time. However, it's not a distribution format, and it's humongous. My little 10-second animation will turn into like an 800-megabyte file if I was to save it using the animation codec. Okay? It gets quite large because it retains almost all of the quality of the original image, which is, in many situations is what we want. But for our situation, I don't want you guys uploading an 800 megabyte file to Canvas. I just, that doesn't serve anyone's best interest. So for what we want to do, we simply need to change the format from animation, and here's the pull down menu that allows you to change it. Animation to, it's below it, uh oh. Why is it not there? That is, huh, well, that's odd. Oh, I know why it's not there. And this is a change that Adobe has made. So there's two things that they're going to force us to change. And they're being very strict about their format options now in comparison to what it was before. So right now, the format's set to QuickTime. If we were to set it to MP4, which is not on here either. OK, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to figure this out because there has been an architecture that has not been installed. Is anyone following along? Is this just an instructor station thing? Or is Liam, you're shaking your head. Is, is the same thing on your screen? I think this happened on my desktop at home, actually. Yeah. OK. Um, I need to sit with computer services and see why we're not getting all of the H.264 uh, codecs showing up on, on this installation. Um, I'm going to guess that this is going to be a systemic problem because this room and then the design lab are working off literally the exact same image. Are you thinking this is the media encoder? Is that what we would be using? Yeah. Um, let's see if it's in media encoder. Maybe this is Adobe really starting to separate After Effects rendering from media encoder, which isn't what I wanted to do, but let's just let's go there. So instead of launching After Effects, uh, I'm going to go into my Applications folder and find Media Encoder, which is this fella right here. Launch it. Let's see if it's in Media Encoder. Because the H.264 codec is wonderful. It makes our, our, uh, our, our video files very, very small. And it retains almost 100% of the perceived quality. It's great. It's a distribution codec. It really is designed for the web. Um, let's see what we get. It's week one. These are one of the bugs that we need to iron out. Luckily, with Media Encoder, we can still import that image sequence in. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if we can interpret and ignore the alpha channel on that. We can take a look at it. The H.264 codec, it's really, not, it's really not a preset, it's just a codec. Oh, in all honesty, I think it actually is a preset in media encoder. But we'll see here in a second. And apparently, media encoder is going to take longer to launch than After Effects. If Adobe is listening to my live stream, you should fix this. This is embarrassing. 
I remember a couple years ago, Adobe came out when they were doing an update to Photoshop, and their banner feature was, it launches in like two seconds. <laughs> They're like, this is the feature, you know, <laughs> we made it faster. They should do that same level of optimization for, uh, for this, for the other apps, because clearly they need it. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got. Um, yeah, it's in here. That's interesting, isn't it? There it is, right there. That's fascinating. OK, so change in plans. And I apologize for kind of changing gears right here in the middle. Uh, but instead of rolling it into After Effects, we're instead going to launch Media Encoder. And you can find Media Encoder inside of your Applications directory on any of the Macs in here, and then of course in the Design Lab. And it's just right there, Adobe Media Encoder. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a pro-level application. And as I mentioned before, its sole fun function, it has one job, and that's to take image sequences and compress and, con and, and transcode them into QuickTime movies. Okay? Uh, you can also do like QuickTime movies to other video formats, but it, that is its sole function, is just to transcode video files. Okay? Now, luckily for us, it's pretty easy to get image sequences into, at, or into Media Encoder. You start it here with a little plus sign. Okay? And once again, you've got to go find the file that you're looking for. Okay. Just got to select the first one, just like After Effects. It's pretty smart. There it is. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. I want to interpret the footage. So I just want to make sure. Let's see, yeah, use frame rate from file. Assume this frame rate, I want it to be 24. And ah, good. Ignore alpha channel. Woohoo. That'll do. OK, that'll do it. So we can do basically the exact same thing that we did over in After Effects, um, you know, right here inside. And I'm just right clicking on the heading for the file itself. It's automatically going to load the H.264 preset. Uh, when you import it in, which is pretty good, because that's exactly what we want to use. I always make sure I know where it's being saved to. I want to save this to my desktop. And now, we're ready to rock and roll. It really is just that simple. And it takes two seconds. It's only like a 10-second animation. Let's see what we got. There it is. That's what I just popped out of Media Encoder. Cool, huh? And it's pretty small, too, if you look at the information on it. Yeah, it's 1.8 megabytes. If you're submitting a file that's 400 megabytes, pause, rewind. You've done this wrong, OK? H.264 codec instead of meeting coder will get it down to the right file size, OK? And this is going to be going forward for every single project we do, maybe minus the final project. If you're submitting a final file, that's many hundreds of megabytes in size. You've done this wrong, OK? And you need to go back in and use the H.264 codec to compress the video down. So if, if, this is, if you're new to this whole sequence, please, please, please make sure you go back in, revisit the live stream, check it out again, OK? Uh, you know, that's why I do these live streams. So we have a good point of reference you know, going forward, OK? All right. So, questions on what we're going to be doing this week for our homework? Yeah. Making a chain animation, yeah. I've given you one chain link. You need to make 10 of them, rig them together using the parent child relationship, apply a background, apply materials, animate it, render, and submit. OK, what specifically? OK. Yeah, so how do we make a parent-child relationship inside of Modo? You don't, that's my Autodesk way of doing it is middle click. In Modo, the relationships are simply made, go into my animation layout here for a second. Relationships are simply made by dragging and dropping like that. Regular drag. Regular drag. 
Regular drag, just a left click and drag from one item on top of the other. Yep, and that will start making the parent-child relationship. This is a great exercise because we get something new, right? We get something new in the parent-child relationship. It also gives us a great opportunity to either you know, learn the animation pipeline or remember <laughs> the animation pipeline. And then everyone needs to go through the process of rendering an, Im an image sequence and pumping it out uh, through Media Encoder. OK? Other questions and comments? Well, good luck. May the force be with you. I will see you guys next Wednesday morning.